Hi everyone, um, welcome to another random question generator from Top Dice. Um, if you uh, if you want to keep seeing these, like and subscribe, please. Uh, joining me this week is um, Alan, member from last episode. Hello. And Jason joins us for the first time. Right, uh, first of all, let's find out what's going on. Jason, I haven't seen you for a while. What's, what's new and what's going on with you? Um, good question. Um, I am working on uh, the Ruin second edition at the moment, which I'm hoping to get out by either the end of the month or middle of next month. Um, I've also got a couple of things going on in the background, cool. uh, one of which will come out as a Kickstarter. Uh, the other one, I think, is just going to be released on drive through uh, I'm currently working on about six different projects, so um, I've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the joys of being a game designer, eh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I enjoy it. I mean, I just the trouble with it is I get kind of when you're doing one thing all the time, you get a bit fatigued from it. So generally, tend to get to the point where I'm getting sick of it, and then I start a new project. I work until I get sick of that, and then I start a new project. I keep working until I get sick of that, and then I go back to the original project and do a bit more of that. Yeah. So just how, uh, you know, and ideas are constantly coming to my head. So I'll sit there and think, oh, that's a good idea, and that'll be a new project. So they add up. Yeah, yeah we've all been there. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, uh, Alan? Uh, yeah, um, so I um, have an interesting, I've got this this week and, and, and this. Which I, I've had PDFs of these, the Castles and Crusades book, for a little while, and I, I, I dove in and got my uh, got my physical copies, and they're just so pretty. Um, and um, and I'm I'm running my second uh, Castles and Crusades session tomorrow evening, um, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I'm kind of doing it as a bit of a play test, really, ahead of Games Expo because we've got all the castles, a load of Castles and Crusades stuff, and I want to know what how it works so that I can speak to people about it. Um, but I've actually really got into it. It's a it's a cracking game, um, and um, I mean the big news really for us, um, as you know, I'm sales manager for GMS. Um, we're we're doing uh, we're going to have two stall uh, two um, stands at UK Games Expo. Um, the, the big news for us is that we um, have got somewhere in be in between uh, Seattle and Warwick at the moment is a big pallet full of stuff from Peso. Um, we've got a, we've, so we're, we're working on a, a deal with Pathfinder um, and uh, with with Peso, sorry for Pathfinder and Starfinder and we're going to be um, supporting their demo efforts at UK Games Expo um, with, a, with a big pile of stock that they're sending to us at the moment so we're, we're really really looking forward to that and um, that's, that's going to be uh, that's, the, that's the that's the big thing really. That's the the big news for us this week. Um, so yeah. Um, all the more reason to go down to the uh, UK Games Expo. Uh, you, you need more reasons. Well, yeah, that's very true. Actually, I really really want to go this year, but I won't be doing. Um, for me, um, I'm. Um, a bit like you, Jason, I keep getting ideas in my head and sort of having to sort of work on them. Uh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a there's a there's uh, a there's a setting a uh, horror sort of space opera apocalyptic sort of uh, post apocalyptic thing that I'm uh, hopefully going to be running um, an actual session of rather than character creation. Um, can't really talk about that at the moment. Um, and also, I'll I'll hopefully be doing uh, for anyone who's interested uh, to join up online and um, take part in a murder mystery sort of uh, short, uh, possibly one shot adventure set on the Orkney Islands during the medieval uh, period. So that that's something that's going on. Um, more on that hopefully when I finish it. Right, so let's move on to the questions. It'll be a little bit different this time. Everyone's getting a different question. Everyone's going to roll the dice. So we don't know what uh, I've got a I've got um, I've got 20 questions. 
And um, Alan, you're going to start. So, roll your dice. Yeah, so uh, this is my uh, my, my trusty uh, Redbox D&D uh, D20 that is um, 40 years old. <laughs> so if it doesn't let it down and go, uh, you know... And... Let's give it a go. And we have got a five. Five! Um, right, number five. Uh, what are your views on random character creation? Ooh, right. So it's it's been a while since I played a game that actually had random character creation. Um, if memory serves, I think this one that was completely random was probably Warhammer. Yeah. Um, uh, to uh, I like it to a point in the, as a gamer as a role player, not knowing what you're getting kind of can. It can help you sort of stretch your stretch your brain a little bit from from a role playing perspective. Um, would I choose a random character generation system? Probably not. Um, I do like it though when a character generation system has some random elements in it. Um, so you know, if you want a backstory, if you want um, something that's happened in that character's history you know be that good or bad or whatever sometimes you can you know roll a dice have a look at a table and it might just give you a little spark of creation that you need to 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 bring that character off the page a little bit um but um yeah a total random character generation not really for me um but but some elements are no not necessarily a bad thing yeah so if it was a choice you know what i mean so Sort of um, like, for example, with with what with uh, Warhammer Fantasy, you can choose. Um, you be okay with that as long as you know, as long as there's the choice. And uh, yeah, I, I think the the, the 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 difficulty is you can end up with a player that's disgruntled because they've got a character that they just really didn't want and don't want to play. You know. Um, Traveller, you know, if you look at Traveller, Traveller has got you know quite a lot of random bits to it, um, yeah. and um, you you can start off with one idea in your head, but because you're rolling the skill improvements and things as terms go on during character creation, you can end up with a character that's completely different to the one that you thought you might get. Um, you know, similarly though, you know, I just said Castles and Crusades, I love it, but you you roll you roll your stats, but at least you you know there there are you can roll and assign. So if you, you, you still design the character that you wanted yeah. in that to a point. Yeah, because random, random attributes are slightly different to sort of, um, like, for, you know, like randomly choosing your, your background or, yeah. you know, slightly different. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, any, what, anything else to add? No, not really. Like I, I think there's a place for both. Um, my my personal preference would be leaning more towards player agency, so the player gets the character that they want for that setting. Um, but I do I do get the whole if it's random, you you've got to put a bit more into it from a role play perspective. So yeah, swings and roundabouts. Cool. Some nice uh, you know some nice nice thoughts on that one. Right, Jason. You've seen what you what you're going to get yourself into. That's on the dice then. Roll away. Five. <laughs> I'll roll it again. <laughs> Reroll. Yeah, yeah, I would roll it again. Seven. Oh, seven. Um, okay. Um, when you're when you're buying a role playing game. What do you what do you look for? What what draws you? What 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 draws you towards a particular game? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, to be honest, it's probably like anybody else. I get drawn in by the artwork on the cover a lot of the time, um, and then I tend to read about it on the back. And then my next stop is generally the character sheet, what it looks like, um, and from that you can. You can pretty much tell what sort of game it's going to be and 
how complex and so forth and so on. Uh, I tend to stay away from anything. If I know it's D20 based, I don't always tend to stay away from it, but I can be a little bit more biased towards it, uh, especially if it's kind of very much 5e kind of inspired. But generally speaking, if I go into a game shop and I see some games on the shelf, or there's a few games I've never heard of before, which is kind of unlikely, unfortunately. But if there's only a game I, I don't know of, I tend to uh, just go over to cover what, in, what drags me in. Really. Cool. Um, okay. Short and sweet, that's brilliant. Right then. Let's see what I get. Get oh, 11. Oh. Not exactly rolling high today, are we? Uh, okay. Number 11. Uh, tell us about the memorable game. Uh, okay. Uh, back in... 1996-ish, I forget, um, around around the time of first, it was first first edition um, uh, Rippers, uh, the Victorian horror setting for Savage Worlds. I hit on this crazy idea of um, having the players babysit um, the... Uh, the Brides of Dracula to go out for the night to a theatre to watch a play because a bigger, nastier threat had come to, had come to London and needed combined efforts of Count Dracula, Van Helsing, a few others to face this. I couldn't tell the characters what, what, what this threat was. So, for, you know, for this all to go, you know, for, you know to go ahead and for Victorian sort of like society to carry on as they, you know, they knew it in their safety. The guys had to take out and entertain for the evening three vampires. Um, and I've never had so much fun as a gem in all my life. Um, because, I mean, uh, there was no combat for one, like three hours. No fighting, um, and these guys, as players, they you know they loved they loved their combat. You know, you know they you know they loved to fight and stuff. Uh, but it went from what I thought was going to be sort of like an awkward, possibly combat-based sort of weird sort of like half adventure. Uh, we actually overran. And, you know, we stayed a little later, and uh, it, it just kept going and going and going. Um, and they really, you know, they really took the sort of, you know, the idea of the sort of like slightly offbeat, weird scenario, which was at odds with the setting, and really went for it. And it kind of stuck with me, and um, sort of personally, I. As a, as a GM, it was it, it was nice, but you know, like you have a like a bit of a weird idea, and the guys just just literally just you know they took it and just went, yeah, okay, that's cool, and we just ran with it. It was awesome. So yeah, for me that was like, I still I still I still try and get that level of uh, kind of like, oh my god, I'm actually pulling this off, you know. So yeah. For yeah. Me, I, I remember playing a one a one shot game like that where literally we turned up at our usual role playing club on a, on a Sunday, and for one reason or another there was um, there was a, there was a few of us with no game to play, and one of the one of the guys said, "Oh, you know, I've I've got an idea. Who, who, you know, what what game systems have we got?" So, you know, delve in the bag, and I had a copy of um, Ju uh, Games Workshop's Judge Dread. Um, so. The guy who actually ran the game didn't know the system, um, but we we rolled up we rolled up our characters and um, and basically he, he was a little bit older than us. I think we were sort of 15, 16 at the time. Me and a couple of the other guys, and he was a little bit older. And it was just after Predator had come out, so basically he, we we were too young to have seen the movie, 
So what he did is he ran um, a predator scenario in a block park in Judge Dredd. And it was just brilliant. Um, a similar thing. There was hardly any combat or anything like that. It was just all sort of role playing and tension and all that. And then, you know, right at the end, the guy was running the game. He needed to crib off somebody else to see how the combat system really works. And uh, but it was just great. It was just one of those really memorable games. It's nice, when, you know, like just like as sort of you know designers and you know you know GMs and etc. It's nice when people pick up your idea and go with it, you know. Mm. Really cool. I mean, uh, personally, I've never published anything, but it's always nice. It's always nice when um, I have one of these bizarre ideas. And right. I want to try this out, see what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's cool. Um, right, so we've all had a question each. Um I've got a follow on, if I may. Any, I can say, go on, follow on question, anyone? So I'm going to expand on the question that Jay got. Um, what was the last game you bought on spec? You know, you said, so what is it? What do you look for in a role playing game? What's the last time? When's the last time you walked into a shop? You looked at a book that you didn't go in there for, and you just thought, I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving that here. I've got to, I've got to bring, I've got to take that one away. Yeah. Um. Last time I did that, uh, it was well, it's a while ago. Um, I walked in and bought completely, completely um, without even without even reading it. I just had a quick look inside and thought, "Oh, geez, I need this." And it was uh, mechanical. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, mechanical dream. It's now out of print, unfortunately. Um, it was just. Uh, the weird book where it had it had two covers. Yeah, uh, you know the way they printed it, it was kind of like it was flipped. Um, cause I think you had the sort of like character. You had yeah, that was it. You had the background and all you know, the, you know the world information stuff on one side. And then yeah. Over, and on the other side was um, sort of like character creation and rules things like that. And I saw it. I mean. It was just, it was just, it kept, it kept looking at me on, on the, um, on the shelf every time I went into the shop because uh, I was getting um, Slay Industries and things like that at the time. And, right. Uh, this thing, it just, it just, it, it was like buy me, and I, I, I'm so glad I have now because to replace, you know, to replace it, silly prices, um, and it just. Literally leapt out, and I had I had to buy it. Mm. Really cool game. So I think for me, I, I was at a convention um, and just browsing through, um, and it was only a small convention, a local one, and um, only, they only ever have actually one trader there, and it's um, the guys from Fanboy Three in Manchester. Um, and I was just sort of browsing through and um, I found um, the One Ring um, and I've been a fan of Merp. Um, I've got pretty much everything that, that was ever put out for, for Merp. Um, and I started looking through the One Ring and, um, and then I looked a little bit more and then I looked a little bit more and the next thing I knew, my card was out. <laughs> yeah, was... Way, yeah, yeah, because it's like, beep, oh, oh no, what would that <laughs> Whoops, there we go. Like, never mind, I've just been mugged. But yeah, yeah. The, was that the second edition or, or the first? Um, it's the second edition, the, um, yeah, the, the sort of current yeah. free league one, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've still not played it, but it's a lovely book. <laughs> uh, I've, got, I've got everything for it. I've yet to run it. Uh, I, I must run it for, I don't know, I'm sure someone would say yes, but... You know, you crack it open and it it looks it looks the part, yeah. So I had to. I missed the Kickstarter, but then I saw it and thought, "Oh, jeez, I need that." Yeah, yeah. Um, Jason, what yourself? Anything that just like literally leapt at you? Um, yeah, I buy a lot of games a week, so <laughs> um, I, I don't know really, to be honest.
trying to think the last thing I bought on spec, I think, rather than it leaped, well, it kind of it kind of intrigued me, I think, I would say, rather than leaped out at me. And that was probably the uh, the zombie side role playing game. Um, mainly because I was kind of just interested to see how it worked, yeah. really. Um, I'm not a big fan of board game companies making role playing games. Um, because generally speaking, it, it doesn't really, it, they're a completely different kind of animal, really. Um, yeah. And I've not been impressed with the previous companies who have made role playing games who have been board game companies. But anyway, yeah, so Zombie Side, Zombie Side was all right. I mean, it, it, <laughs> this is a problem. I have. <laughs> a lot of the time I go to this game, they look great, and you get them and you think, well, how is this? You know, anyway, uh, Zombie Side seems all right. The system seems fine. I don't like the fact that you've got pre generated characters in it. And you can't make characters very, you know, really. But um, I mean, that's the last one that kind of really jumped out at me that I can think of. Um, yeah, yeah, that was probably the last thing. I mean, before that was probably Pirate Borg intrigued me, so I, I got that. Yeah, well, uh, before mine, uh, in the kind of dream, uh, it was actually Slay Industries, and weirdly for the cover. And um, no, dis no disrespect for the guys at Nightfall. I'd say this if they were here. You know, sorry guys. But first edition Slay, as brilliant as it is, had the most drab, odd cover that's ever been on a book for a rock. You know, like, well, you know, because it's, it's brown, it's got a guy in a, a coat. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like... It's a slay. What yeah. uh, what is that? You know, back back then back then it was all kind of like uh what did you have? It's like Traveller, Cyberpunk, uh I forget which version of D D it was. Um you know, and it was all, all all the covers were kind of like well, you know, look at you know the Palladium covers, it was all like big sort of in your face. And this thing was just like sat on the back, you know, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, being kind of like, it's like, you know, what's the weird looking thing in the back, you know? So it was like, come get me, you know? So I, I'm glad I did that one as well, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Slay Industries is a weird one. Well, I think it's because it was English. Um, and a lot of role playing games at that time, were a lot of them were Americans, hmm. uh, especially the more expensive kind of cover ones, you know? I mean, if they were, could get over into England, then they were, they were a company that could afford to, yeah. Export and so forth. I mean, everything were estivium, but uh, I think British co companies generally didn't tend to. It wasn't exactly a, a big industry over here at the time. No. I mean, Games Workshop was kind of a main one. They did Cthulhu and Judge Dread, and obviously yeah. um, a few other bits and pieces. Then they kind of stopped, didn't they? Yeah, um, Room Quest. Games Workshop's Room Quest edition was yeah, uh, yeah. Was, was good. They did a lot of stuff like that, and that was, I mean, I remember going to game shops when I was a kid and, and seeing stuff like RuneQuest and Cthulhu in a big box, you know, I think I've still got, I mean, I've got the Judge Dredd and stuff, all the big big box stuff, and it was yeah, great, yeah. you know, and that was all done by Games Workshop, because they were kind of, and then when they stopped it, it kind of got harder to get hold of stuff, you had to go through a stevium, um, and often you didn't, I mean, it's like, for example, Pinnacle, um, it was hard to get hold of Pinnacle stuff over here. And yeah, buying America was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, is it just be you know, but the, the cost of postage was stupid, but um, I mean, I don't really pay Pinnacle anymore, but I mean, the very fact that it's going to be easy to get hold of for some people is going to make life a lot easier, but because it is hard to get hold of, even the core rule book, if you try to go on any of the website, you know, any of the name, main ones like Games Law or Les or Les of um, games and stuff, and they never have it in stock, so uh. So, well, yeah, I, 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 I must I must speak to uh, I must speak to uh, Leisure Games then if they if they've they've not got any because we've got a big stack of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think they'll do well with the rule books. Um, but yeah, I'm not so I'm not I'm not so. Sh I mean, pays everything all together. You know, they are available in most places. But yeah, it's it's uh, yeah things like Troll Lord Games and Spinnacle were too hard companies to get hold of for stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's one of the reasons why we're we're doing what we're doing at the moment. Um, yeah. Is that you know we're working with a lot of US companies and and um, 
and insane to them. You know, the the reason that the that stuff became hard to get is just because of the operating models of some of the distributors, in that they're not ordering it from the publisher until they've got a significant number of back orders from retailers. Yeah. So retailers can be waiting for six months or what or, or whatever it may be before they get their stuff, um, and you know we we. At, you know, GMS. We decided let let's tip that on its head. Um, it all started with um, when I when I published um, when I published that last year. Um, I was trying to sell that into game shops, trying to sell Section D into game shops, and plenty of people saying that sounds really good, but I'm not going to buy it because I can't get the core rules. Um, so we set about changing that, um, and uh, you know it's. It's starting to uh, starting to really get some traction now. So um, you know, we we we've got all of, we've got like I said uh, earlier on, we've got a hundred lines of pinnacle, um, a hundred pinnacle lines that we're going to have at UK Games Expo, um, and uh, I think we've got fifteen or sixteen, seventeen different lines on Troll Lord. Um, we've we've just signed up Acheron Games, so we're going to have Lex Arcana and. Um, Oh, what's the spaghetti fantasy one? Francolonia. Francolonia. Yes, thank you. Francolonia. Um, so yeah, we're going to have those, and we've just got all the Gaxland stuff in Heidi Gaxland's uh, Heidi Gygax uh, Garland's stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's really it's time to pick up. Like a golden age of role playing, almost. Yeah, uh, not to be too controversial, you know, but, you know, <laughs> but, um, at the moment, we've never had so much choice. Uh, I, 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 I remember going into certain shops uh, around where I live and uh, basically being, um, well, laughed at because it's like, well, what, what, what the hell is on that for? You know, it's like, well, no one buys that. It's like, yeah, I remember saying, to them, well, only because you don't sell it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I was quite, I was quite active on the um, on the forums for Pinnacle. You know, uh, you know, talking to you know the likes of Clint Black and mm -hmm. you know, you know, Wiggy and everyone, and um, um, and you know the 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 number of people on there was well, still is, it's huge, you know. And then you know you go to a shop and it's just like D and D D and D D and D. Yeah, it's like, well, hang on a minute, where's the game I play? You know, it's really annoyed me because it was like, well, I I want to play what I, you know, I'm online. Yeah. And I want to I want to have a book to play, and it's where the bloody hell is it? Um, cause, you know the you know the distributors, you know. Uh, a while ago were atrocious for this country because you, you know you couldn't get you couldn't get a sniff of a rule book if it didn't have a particular logo on it you know um but thankfully that's all changed you know it's, it's a commercial it, it, it's yeah my, my opinion is it, it's the, it's being people being risk averse commercially because i think they're reluctant to buy stock spend the money on shipping it and yeah. things like that without knowing for certain that it's going to sell um and yeah. the, the you know the business model changed when as deviant was bought out by asmodee the asmodee model comes in you know, i don't know if um uh, if anybody saw the uh, financial report from asmodee I mean, you, you know that asmodee as a business has been um or, or the group that owns asmodee has been restructured and a, lo a big load of debt from that um, from that group has been put onto Asmodee's assets. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I, um, yeah. And then when you look at Asmodee's latest financial report, there is no mention there of role-playing games being part of their key market. It's board games and CCG, mm. um, and um, and you know wizard stuff um and you know so but that's fine do you know what that works for them and because they do that they create a big gap great big hole that somebody else can quite easily step into 
and have the confidence that if they can get the stuff, you know, it is a case of, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, and, and that's what's happening. Um, so, you know, we're really proud to get stuff out there now that people want. And people have been saying for a while, you know, we, we can't get hold of this stuff that we really want. Um, it shows you, know, so. you, I mean, and as well, it shows you that there's a definite market, there's a definite customer base. Mm. Massive. Obviously, you know, are you going to fill that void with awesome games? Which is really cool. Right. Excellent. Um, okay. What we'll do, we'll uh, call an end to that for now. That's. And uh, if you do want to um, take take part in this, please uh, please message us on the uh, uh, the Facebook page um, again. Like and subscribe uh, so we can do more of this randomness. So it's uh, goodbye from me and goodbye from these two. See you soon. Well.